Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're here to discuss PCAM again. We're going to go through uh, chapter eight, which has to do with phase diagrams and, uh, and, and the stability of solids, liquids, and gases. This is mostly, uh, uh, this is mostly just a expansion on what we should have seen in a lot of in general chemistry. So that's a lot of what PCAMs will build on. So once again, always, always, always a step further. Okay, so first chapter we're talking mainly, oh, oh crap. Uh, so, thing just crashed at the end of the world. Let's get it back. Okay. Zoom share. Okay, so. Mistakes were made. So, this chapter is going to start by talking about, like, phases, phase changes, and why they may or may not be stable. Why we're going to see, oh, this is going to sublime at room temperature, at, like, at this temperature, and this is going to melt, and we're going to talk about colligative properties and all that jazz. So, but first let's define a phase. A phase, if you don't know, form a matter that is uniform with respect to its chemical composition with a state of aggregation on both microscopic and macroscopic length scale. So it's uniform and it's all mixed together of the same chemical, but it's also mixed together at the same rate of sticking together. So for example, liquid, it's kind of able to slosh around. The atoms are able to move over each other, but they're not and they're not really stuck in one place. There's a large amount of interaction both on a molecular level and and like the, the liquid level where we can see it. Solid, they're going to vibrate, they're going to kind of bounce around, they're going to kind of stick together a bit. Not a whole lot of motion. And that's both on the small scale and the big scale. Gases, atoms are pretty separate. They're not going to really interact with each other, both on the molecular level, and that's what we see the why gas has all its neat properties that we talked about in chapter seven. So why are certain phases stable at specific temperatures and pressure? Why is water a liquid at room temperature, but if I pressurize it enough, suddenly it goes solid? Or if I chill it down to zero degrees, it suddenly freezes. And all this comes back down to the Gibbs free energy, the minimization of Gibbs free energy and the minimization of our chemical potential. We're gonna store the most amount of chemical potential within that compound. The most amount of Gibbs energy, make the most negative Gibbs energy, you know, store the most amount of energy into that. So let's remember, we said that chemical potential was equal to how Gibbs changes with respect to the amount of moles at constant temperature and pressure. And factoring in that, moles that, that Gibbs is equal to moles times the molar Gibbs. And we said chemical potential. So if we take the integral of that with respect to moles, we get that chemical potential is simply the Gibbs mole. And we talked about that all in chapter six. So the change in chemical potential is equal to the change, the, the yeah, is equal to the change in Gibbs molar energy. Gibbs molar energy was equal to here's our here's our magical what was it Maxwell relationships? It's the we split up Gibbs. Gibbs splits into the molar entropy with changing temperature and the molar volume with changing pressure. So looking at how chemical potential changes with temperature at a constant pressure, you have what has to, it relates with the amount of entropy negative entropy and how chemical potential changes at a constant pressure relates to the 
molar volume. If we increase the pressure, that essentially the, how the chemical potential is going to change relates to what the volume of the thing is. Uh, the chemical potential of the temperature, actually, it, yeah, it depends on the volume of the phase. The how if there's a pressure decreases, it depends on the entropy of that phase. Since volume always has to be positive and entropy always has to be positive, chemical potential will tend to decrease as temperature increases. So, and chemical potential will tend to decrease with decreasing pressure. Both go down, they have to, if those go negative and that negative, that makes that a positive. That goes negative, when that goes positive, that makes that negative. So that all works. So, so we're gonna try to minimize our chemical potential. A few things to remember. Heat is absorbed to melt solids and to vaporize liquids. So meaning that how does entropy change? It, well, that's gonna be the enthalpy over the temperature. So our change in entropy is always positive for a reversible phase change. So heat is absorbed to go from solid to liquid. So you're taking the endothermic absorption divided by our temperature. So our heat capacity is always positive. Heat capacity is always positive. So that what does that mean? The entropy of a gas is always going to be more than the entropy of a liquid, which is always going to be more than the entropy of a solid. So looking at that, if temperature increases, we have a, a decrease in chemical potential. And as chem temperature increases, we have entropy going, as phase increases, the entropy is going to change. So we can draw a series of lines where we're looking at the chemical potential based on that entropy. So a solid with the lowest ratio, lowest ratio, it's always gonna be decreasing as we go from left to right as temperature is going up. Temperature is going up, the chemical potential is going down. Cha, 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 cha. Now this is, this is not a steep slope because the entropy is very low. Said liquid is going is greater than solid, so it's a steeper slope going from here to here. As temperature goes up, it go, chemical potential goes down, and then gas with the highest entropy will have the steepest slope. This this is a essentially the slope of it. the entropy of that is the slope of that graph. Gas is steepest slope as temperature goes down. As temperature goes up, chemical potential goes down. So we have three lines, each with the slope of the relative entropy of that phase. What you see is there is between those guys, there are two intersection points. You have an intersection between solid and liquid, and an intersection between liquid and gas. Now, so, as you go from solid to liquid at that temperature, you can say, we want to achieve the lowest chemical potential. So if this you could imagine drawing that line, it's gonna keep going up here. At this temperature, would it be better to be liquid up here or solid down here? Well, it's obviously gonna be solid, boom. But if I keep going here, well, suddenly I'm over here. Would it be better to be solid right here or liquid. Well, I'm gonna get onto the liquid slope. The gas is way over here, so it's be, be good to be liquid at this point, but as soon as we cross over this threshold, that intersection point, suddenly gas has the lowest chemical potential. So we're always gonna be minimizing our chemical potential. So this is explaining, if you draw with the entropy of these phases, you can predict what is the, uh, the, the temperature at which we see the phase change based on where these lines would intersect. Now, my faces 
my lovely face is kind of in the way. But so if you follow the path, this path assumes a gradual change. If you heat, so you go da 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 switch over da 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 switch over da 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 keep going. If you heat too rapidly, we can get super heating and super cooling. Whereas like I keep heating da 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 and it doesn't realize, oh, I'm not at the most stable point. And so suddenly it will all melt at once, boom. Or you go super cool and it freezes back here. Suddenly, oh, snap freezes as it jumps from liquid below zero to solid below zero. So it's just like, A, it's not quite stable, but it hasn't had a chance to realize there's a lower chemical potential there. Now, the previous graph was calculated at a constant pressure. Well, what if we were to say, look at these graphs at a changing pressure? Well, we'd see another slope where the volume changes. Remember, volume of gas is much greater than volume of liquid. Volume of liquid is usually greater than a volume of a solid. So this will lead to our graphs being shifted, Sh graphs being shifted by a certain amount. So we've extended them to like say, see the, the, the solid line has gone up by a little bit. The liquid line has moved to the right a little bit. And the gas line has moved to the right a lot. So at a higher pressure, it stays solid a little bit longer. And then it stays liquid a lot longer. Higher pressure, it takes a lot more energy to turn this into a gas. Because it's being shifted over. Now, the, the, this, uh, this will result in a boiling point elevation. So higher pressure means higher boiling point. We won't typically see this too much for a solid, but you will see this occasionally. Now, depending on the density of the solid, the volume of the liquid could be greater or the volume of the solid could be greater. So this could lead to either a freezing point elevation or a freezing point depression, actually. We see this with water, uh, a different effect than we would for like most metals because water, remember, is is less dense than ice. Ice floats on water. Wait, sorry. Ice is less dense than water. So, see the, a different sized effect. That water will actually free a uh, freezing point depression as as opposed to a freezing point elevation. So, this one is with water. See, it's moves back quite a bit, as opposed to this one where it's moving forward. High pressure solid melts at a higher temperature, unless it's ice, which then it melts at a lower temperature. Now, because the slope of the chemical potential over temperature for a gas is much greater than a solid, that of a solid or liquid is possible for to either completely bypass the liquid phase due to how the slopes intersect. So if this is the solid line, here is the liquid line, the gas line is here. So the solid, the liquid would be right there. Gas line is here, so it's intersecting above this point. This is our sublimation. So it's going from solid to gas without passing through liquid. Now, if all three lines intersect, we go solid, liquid, gas all at the same time. That's our triple point. You might recognize that from our phase diagram. The temperature where all three phases can exist simultaneously. And this will get us to our standard pressure temperature phase diagram. By taking these individual cross-sectional chemical potential and temperature at various pressures, we create this. So those, this whole thing, imagine doing a, 
a billion of these, one at each pressure, and drawing this over. That those intersections are at a simple pressure, and we're moving it over each time and looking at this. These are just a series of intersecting lines for the geez. Simply a series of intersecting lines where the phases are separating the phases of the material. These lines are called coexistence curves. So this is the this would be the sublimation point where you have both solid and gas. This would be the melting the boiling point where you have both liquid and gas. This would be the melting point where you have both solid and liquid. This coexistence curve is where the melting occurs. You get a little bit below that, it's spontaneous to be a solid. A little bit above that, it's spontaneous to be a liquid and you'll completely melt. But if you're right at that correct temperature and pressure, you, you can have a little bit of both. So our standard boiling would be done at, what, one bar? But we can also get our normal boiling point, one atmosphere, depending on what you're looking at. But we'll see in here a triple point. So the point where the curves have shifted so much that we, all three lines intersect at the same point. But we'll also see that critical point. We talked about that a bit, a point above which the gas and liquid phases are indistinguishable as a supercritical fluid. So we said, oh, it's no longer gonna condense anymore. It's just gonna act as an ideal gas at all points. So, so I mean, that is not the only curve we'll see. There's some very unusual ones for many solids. Sometimes more than one solid structure can exist. And all of these can be factored into a phase diagram. Some solid phases will have different packing, so they'll exhibit various stabilities under various pressures and temperatures. Water has been known to exhibit 10 other phases besides the true traditional hexagonal shape at high pressure. So 1H, this right here, that's our traditional ice at, where at relatively low pressure. But if we get into higher pressures, we can, higher pressures and low enough temperatures, it can shift into all sorts of strange shapes here. But there's a whole mess in here that is being left out that where essentially you're high of uh, pressure and something the freezing point goes up. In this case, look, look, as pressure increases, the freezing point goes down till we get to this point. Well, now the freezing point is going up as pressure goes up and up and up and up and up till the point where it's jumped up crazy high at a high enough pressure, it will freeze at what? That's 100 degrees C. If you have it a little bit over one gigapascal, maybe like three gigapascal, something like that. And you're at the top phase VI, uh, phase seven. Sulfur will adopt a monoclinic under this phase. It can be rhombic right here and gas there. So we have a different shapes of uh, the crystal structure depending on high pressure, low pressure. So sulfur so would adopt one phase and then shift and then shift again as it melts at one atmosphere. But if you go high enough pressure, you'll just skip from rhombic straight to liquid. So note that so which one of these guys is gonna be more dense? Well, as pressure goes up, it, we favor the rhombic. So that kind of tells me something about high pressure, you're gonna be a more dense structure. The rhombic is gonna be more dense than our monoclinic. Now looking at these guys again, we can look at a phase vapor temperature diagram. Now, if we only look at the phase dependence on pressure and temperature, we lose very important variable, the volume. 
So we, if we look at just these guys, we lose the fact that we're looking at volume at all. So it's sometimes good to have a one that looks at three different things, phase, volume, and temperature. Uh, the, sorry, pressure, volume, and temperature. So if the temperature is increased at a constant pressure on a, a, a pressure temperature diagram, you do a poor job of showing how the phase, tradition, uh, the phase transition actually occurs. You don't see the melting boiling point when you look at here. It's just like, boop, it's done. But here you actually look at this. So look at this. This is a cross-sectional three-dimensional graph. Pressure, volume, temperature. Look here. If this is the solid phase, this is the liquid phase, the solid and vapor, this is liquid and vapor. So, for example, at a constant temperature, the gas, you start to decrease the volume, decrease the volume by upping the pressure. You hit a certain point where the volume decreases, but the pressure stays the same as it starts to condense and suddenly it's liquid. Bam! And it shoots, the pressure shoots up until the, it's all solid. And the volume is going down even though pressure is more or less, I mean, I, I'm sure if I kept going, the pressure would keep shooting up. At a critical point, well, the temperature goes down, 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 down the pressure going up and it then just goes bypasses the liquid altogether. So, so this, this is solid and vapor. So at this temperature, I don't go liquid. I just go, so it starts to sublime or, or condense out of there. And then it just goes, when it fully condenses, it goes to solid. So we're just looking at essentially what is actually happening under these three dimensional structures. What's actually happening as we're changing these phases, we're combining a pressure volume like this, a thousand tiny slices of that at different temperatures. That, so we can represent what's an isobaric change, what's an isochoric change, what's an isothermal change. This will be our isothermal, temperature staying the same. Isobaric, so if I keep the pressure the same and I just increase the temperature, it starts to melt, solid and liquid, it melts. Now it's all liquid and then it starts, then it starts to boil and then the gas and the, and the volume just increases, keeps increasing. This one doesn't really show any like, constant volume situations, but like if you decrease the pressure, you go, oh, it's going from gas, or from solid to liquid, well, it would have to be going like that. Gas to a liquid vapor as pressure goes down. So it goes to solid vapor and keep going like that. But so there's a lot of math behind this graph that we're gonna just ignore for the most part. But how do we get these coexistence curves? How were they calculated? Well, so you're actually gonna look at the the, the chemical potentials of each phase. We're going to look at if both phases have to exist at equilibrium, the chemical potentials must be equal. So the chemical potential of phase A and the chemical potential of phase B and the pressure and temperature. As you move along the curve, this must be true. Well, the chemical potential of A plus the change in the chemical potential of A must be equal to the chemical potential of B plus the phase, the, chem, the change in chemical potential of B. And so if change in chemical potential is this, as we looked, talked about earlier, we can set these two things equal to each other. The entropy of phase A at that temperature plus the volume of phase A at that pressure with the entropy of phase B at that temperature and the volume phase B of the pressure. Solving that equation for uh, the solving the difference, so adding them to both sides, you get the, the difference of A and B over the difference of 
uh, essentially the difference of entropy over the difference of equals the difference of volume. You rearrange this, and this is how you get the magical clausius clapeyron equation that gave us such trouble in general chemistry. The equation that says, how does the pressure change of a gas at changing temperature? That's what Clausius gave us. And that actually changes as a function of entropy and volume. So if you calculate the change in pressure versus the change in temperature for fusion, it's approximately 55 bars per Kelvin, which means it takes 50 bars to raise or lower the freezing point. So it takes a lot of energy to raise and lower that freezing point. Not too practical. But if you do the same for a vaporization on something, because the because the entropy of that is a big change, but the volume is an enormous change. You get about 0 0.05 bars per Kelvin, meaning that for every bar you increase, uh, elevates the boiling point by 20 Kelvin. So that is a huge change. So that pressure has a great effect on the boiling point of most solids. So using the closure of the arm, if we integrate this, so integrate this as change in P over change in T. It, it, we could look at entropy or volume, but it's much easier to calculate entropy as delta H over as delta H with delta H over T is equal to entropy. So we can plug that in. Now, we don't really know V, but it's much easier to exchange V for RT over P, R ideal gas equation. So plugging that in for there, we are going to get everything to the other side and we integrate this. So let's look at that. Let's just look at that real quick. So we had, Integral of P of DP, which is nothing right now, equals S over V integral of DT, which right now we don't have any T's or any P's, but you can say what well, S is equal to H over T, and V is equal to VM specifically is RT over P. So that means we have we have uh, so we have this as right now plugging things in dp equals h over r t t So then, yeah. oh, sorry. Let's see. Oh, sorry. RT times T. So what do we have? So keeping this in mind, factoring out constants H over R integral one over t squared dt. Get the p to the other side equals one over p dp. The integral of one over x is not equal to ln x. Integral of one over x squared is negative one over x to the first. So that's how we get the magical clausius clapeyron which would say ln p2 over p1 equals negative h over r 1 over t1 t2 minus 1 over t1. So the equation itself, something we sh you should have learned in general chemistry. But we get this by looking at, there's some math and magic that we do in PCHEM to get this. So it's not just 
waving our hands. We actually use calculus and use our PCAM to get this by looking at what we're actually looking at. So with this equation, we can calculate vapor pressure at any given temperature where liquid and gas coexist. So looking at this, the standard boiling point of water is 373.15. What would the boiling point be if the pressure was increased to five bar, one bar? Assume the enthalpy of evaporation is 40.65. So let's look at that. Select all. So, okay. 370T initial is 373.15. P initial is one bar. P2 or P final is five bars. And they say that uh, enthalpy of vaporization is 40.65. Just gotta once again all watch the mm -hmm. units. Watch the units. And R is 8.314. That in mind, watching the units, watching the units, watching the units. We have ln five over one bars cancels the bars. That's good. So we need to turn kilojoules into joules. Four zero six fifty. Over eight point three one four times. 1 over T2 minus 1 over 373. Okay, so let's start. Natural log of 5. Must be natural log, mind you. It's 1.609. We multiply by our R, divide by our negative uh, H. We get H. Or zero six fifty gives you negative three point two nine times ten to the negative fourth. We add our one over three seventy three point one five. That gives us point zero zero two three five. We invert that to give us T two. So at five bar, five bar T2. The, the boiling point has increased to 425.4. Or essentially, the boiling point has been jumped up to 152. So that's a pretty significant increase. Five bar, the boiling is now almost 50 degrees higher. So that's kind of the same concept we use when we talk about pressure cookers. You increase the pressure, increase the boiling point, and heat food at higher temperature and thus cook them faster. Now, surface tension. We can relate this factor to surface tension. How can liquid vapor barrier on a droplet be treated with these equations? So, if we think about the attractive forces in the droplet, we will try to minimize the surface to volume ratio of the sphere. So, what is the the surface area of the sphere, whereas what is the volume contained within there. But so the droplet will expand to increase the surface area at a constant volume and temperature. So if that happens, work will be done. I Meaning so if the change in area is going to be the work of expansion, which is equal to gamma times the surface tension. Well, gamma is the surface tension. Gamma times change in sigma. Gamma is the surface tension. Sigma is the area of the sphere for pi r squared.
So it's not the area, not the volume of the sphere, but the area, which is 4 pi r squared. So looking at the surface tension as the area is expanding. So the radius of the sphere changes from r to r prime, which we're going to say r plus the change in r. We've increased by the change in r. So the change in the area is equal to r squared. It is the, if you do the square root, so it's gone from r to r plus dr, you have to factor that in. r squared, you get dr squared, but you also have 8r dr because you add up, you did the evaluate within there. And then of course you subtract, subtract the 4r squared. So you get the radius of the sphere is equal to 8r dr because if the change in radius is small, then the change squared is going to be even smaller and goes to the point where it's insignificant. So we can look at just the radius of the sphere change to 8 pi r dr. So this makes it work 8 pi gamma r dr. So the work over the change in radius is equal to 8 pi gamma r. And that becomes our force. The force is work over a distance. So the work is 8 pi r, pi gamma, times our distance r. Now, because the force inside and outside the droplet must be equal, we can say that 4 pi r squared times the pressure of the outer plus 8 pi r, pi gamma r, equal 4 pi r squared pressure of the inner. So, so the P, or essentially we can separate it into just P inner over equals P outer plus pi gamma over R. So you're adding, so the pressure out, the pressure inner will always be greater than the pressure outer, but the pressure outer is is going to be less than by a factor of the surface tension and the radius. The surface tension is the same, it's constant. That's going to limit the size of the drop based on the inner pressure. So this means, but this means, however, we can use the radius of a droplet to calculate what the internal pressure must be. Or in use, if we can calculate the internal pressure, we can figure out what must the radius of the droplet be. And look at capillary action of the similar properties. You know, so like capillary action, as pressure pushes down, it's gonna it's gonna stick to a tube and create a meniscus. But we see in mercury, we actually have an opposite effect where it'd be pushing down the other way. We have a negative capillary action, but the same effect from pressure differentials on a curved surface can be applied to a capillary tube. The surface tension of liquid is less than the solid uh, that wets the surface. If it is greater than the solid, it avoids the surface. So like the idea of rose petals, uh, will the water will beat up on the rose petals while water might get a what, metal surface wet because the surface tension of the, it's like, of the liquid is less than that of the solid. So water will spread out on certain sur surfaces but beat up on others. So the difference in this pressure of a curved surface, as I said, it was 2 gamma over r. But there must be weight of a column, so we have to factor in how much the water weighs. So as these curved up, as we change this, we have to take into fact the density, the gravity, and the height of a column. Density and gravity are constant, so the height you're gonna go up a column relates to what the surface tension of the liquid, two, pi, two gamma, the density of the liquid, gravity, 
and the obviously r will be the the diameter of the column what type of circle this has to make as we go in there the radius of the column this model only really works if you assume complete wetting or non-wetting meaning it either completely a he spreads on the surface or completely avoids the surface. But a more realistic model would actually deal with the contact angle with a complete wetting being zero and a non-wetting being 180 such that we'd have to say oh, it's R cosine theta. And thus height is like PGR cosine theta. So kind of like dealing with activity and activity coefficients where it's not 100% or 0%, it's some factor in between. But okay, so let's look at this last problem, finish off this chapter. Capillary action. Uh, it's a straw with a diameter of 0.219 inches inserted into a solution of ethanol. What height would the ethanol draw up into the straw, assuming uh, complete wetting, so 100% wetting, contact angle of surface of zero. So cosine zero is one. If the surface tension is 0 0.02197 newton per meters, the density is 789.3 kilograms per meter cubed. You just really have to watch the units. You have to watch the units. So let's look at that. So let's pull this up, select, so we have, actually we have a diameter, diameter is 0.219 inches. We have gamma equals 0.2197 newtons per meter. Density equals 789.3 kilograms per meter cubed. And we're going to say gravity is 9.8. 9.8. So with that in mind, one thing we really need to change is our, well, we really need to, yeah, we, the only thing we really need to change is our diameter to radius and our inches to centimeters. So there's 2.54 centimeters in inch, 2.2. 2.19 times 2.54 centimeters per inch, and then we have to divide that by two. Well, and then turn it into meters. And so turn that into meters, divide by a thousand, Actually, divide by 100 because it's in centimeters, you would get, oh, goody, point, really smaller, 0 0.0027813 meters. That's the radius of the straw. Okay, that in mind. Our equation. Equation. Two times 0 0.2197 newton per meter divided by our, our 789.3 times 9.8 times 0 0.0027813. That's going to give us the height in meters. 
So you may need to change this back to centimeters later or millimeters depending so that it makes sense. So it's like a reasonable number, but let's look at that. 789.3 divided by 9.8 divided by 0 0.0027813. That's 0 0.02. So you multiply by, by 100, get back in centimeters, and that would give us, it would go up two centimeters up that straw, 2.04 centimeters. But let's look at our units. A newton was like what? A kilogram per meter second squared. Kilogram per meter second squared. So turn a unit into a kilogram per meter second divided by meters is going to be a kilogram per second squared. Divided by kilogram per meter cubed gets it into meters cubed per second squared. Defined by gravity gets it into meters squared and divided by meters gets it into just meters. So if you watch all the units, this part cancels out with this part and this part and that part. And these two cancel with that and that. So, units all work out in the end as long as you're careful. That is this chapter. Oh, what? Yeah, I think I might have a typo. Let's see. Yeah. No, no, it's two millimeters. I think I, uh, yeah, I left out that zero there. The surface tension is that. So there's two millimeters, not, not two centimeters. But either way, that's still the same premise. Everything cancels out except for meters, which we then turn into millimeters. But okay, so that is this chapter. It's a very short chapter, but it covers a lot of general chemistry groundwork that we kind of wave our hands and say, oh, it, it works, trust us. And so hopefully this has been a little bit informative of why things are the way they are. So, well, have a good day and uh, pleasure to came in with you. So this has been the Chemistry Cowboy. Once again, if you like what you see, please like, please subscribe. I'll be posting more videos to give you the education you need. And I've been asked to put this disclaimer at two Bethel students. Remember that the log and the online learning guidelines remain in effect while interacting with any type of instructional materials slash sessions. That's it. Over and out.